Hello friends and greetings for the day. Welcome back to another tutorial on ISTQB foundation level sample paper discussions where we are talking about the tips and tricks related to the examination to ace your examinations better. In this tutorial, we are still continuing with the chapter 4 and talking about the test techniques related sample questions and uh, in the previous tutorial we covered some of them. Today we shall be continuing to discuss further with some more interesting sample questions from the test techniques. So the very first technique or very first question from this particular tutorial, we are getting started with the question number 21 on the boundary value analysis. First of all, uh, the content is quite uh, a lot, so I, of course I cannot fit them in line. So I've just adjusted them side by side just to make sure that you can visualize them together. But of course, it will in the real examination, they will be put right below one another. So it won't be such confusing in the real examination. So just mind it for some time. So the question says, you are testing a system that calculates the final course grade for a given student. The final grade is assigned based on the final results according to the following rules. So the rule is on the left. If you see, there are different partitions created, different equivalence partitions created here, 0 to 50, 51 to 60. So up to 50, it is failed. So they may have some uh, specific outputs here. And then 51 to 60 is fair. 61 to 70 is satisfactory. 71 to 80 is good. 81 to 90 is very good. And then 91 to 100 is excellent. At this point, you should understand something very important that uh, the each of these value are my boundary values because they are fixed. If I say something very specific, if you remember from my tutorials, that anything less than this, then I don't have an extreme boundary on the left hand side. And same way, if I say greater than this, that means anything greater than this, there is no extreme right boundary. And that is the reason we have not taken the extreme values, which could be infinity as well. And that is where here, as it is a fixed boundary that nothing less than zero could be a max and nothing greater than 100 could be a max and that is where we have fixed uh, destinations on both the side fixed boundaries on both the sides that is extreme left and extreme right in that context every single value is taken as a boundary because i know some of you may start thinking that hey why did we take zero and 100 as a boundary value no when you have fixed boundaries defined, that means there's nothing beyond that and there's nothing less than that, then the extreme values are also considered as boundary values. And in that context, we have 12 boundary values here. So let's further look into the question. The uh, All the values here, first of all, are boundary values. And at the same time, there are 12 of them. So now let's come to the right, right hand side of this question. It says, you have prepared the following set of test cases. And if you see, we just created six test cases. And it says the values are 91, 50, 81, 60, 70, and 80. All right, fine. What's the question? So what is the two value boundary value analysis? That means by applying two point analysis, what is the two point BVA coverage for the final result that is achieved with the existing test cases? I think, see, a simple concept, what they may ask you is, number one, they would ask you to derive the minimum number of test cases, but in boundary value analysis most of the time we know that the question itself gives you the answer right because the question has the partitions defined and extreme values of each partition are called as boundary value analysis so sometimes they may twist around and say that hey this is the range what we have and then we have tried these many tests what percentage coverage has been achieved so in that case you have to be careful with two things number one to identify the boundary values which we have already done we got 12 boundary values here. Second is how many of them we have covered in our test. So very critical part is the second one because sometimes the numbers could be very trickly, very trickly written and we may not pay attention that whether we covered a boundary value or something next to it. So you have to be very observant when it comes to uh, looking at the table like what test cases they have tried and those test cases should be aligned to that of the ranges given to you. So we must be very extra cautious to compare these values to cross check that are they really covering the boundary values or maybe some of them are not and then you just do a simple division you divide the total by the number of tested and you would get the percentage coverage i mean the tested divided by the total number of boundary values and multiplied by 100 so in this case if you see uh, quickly the test cases which we have created so the test cases we have created is 91 91 is a boundary value 50 is a boundary value 
81 is a boundary value, 60 is a boundary value, 70 is boundary value, and 80 is also a boundary value. That means put together, we covered six out of 12, which makes it very simple and straightforward that it has achieved 50% coverage. And in that context, putting up all together, the right answer for this particular question is A, that is 50% boundary value coverage has been achieved with this particular number of test cases. So I think sometimes they can just twist around, twist around a little bit. So we, do, we should not be confused that what exactly they're asking. We must be clear with the concept of a technique, not only how to solve it, right? A theoretical understanding of the technique would be of great help to conclude a particular answer. Let's look at the next question here. The next question we are picking up is about decision table testing. And the question we are talking about is number 22. Again, crunch of space. So I had to align the table uh, right next to it somewhere here. But uh, in the real examination, they will be well right exactly at the position where they're supposed to be. So your favorite bicycle daily rental store has just introduced a new customer relationship management system and asked you as one of their most loyal members to test it. The implemented features are as follows. So they have three conditions provided to here that should be paid attention to. Anyone can rent a bicycle. That means anyone, okay? That's, that's how you read a scenario basically. When you read the scenario, you, you know, impress or you know, stress on those words which are very, very important for us to derive something very key information from the scenario. So the first criteria is anyone can rent a bicycle, but members will receive a 20% discount. That means a 20% discount is applicable only to members. The second condition is, however, if the return deadline is missed, the discount is no longer available. Now here they did not specify anything or, you know, particularly member, but if you notice the discount was only applicable to member, that means the second condition applies to members as members alone because they are one who are going to have the 20% discount. And uh, if they miss the deadline to return on time, the deadline simply means returning the bicycle on time, uh, uh, the duration you rented for, uh, the discount will no longer be available. Fine, what's the third condition? After 15 rentals, members will get a gift that is a t-shirt. That means only if you have completed 15 rentals, you'll be getting a complimentary gift that is a t-shirt. Fine, that's great. Now, decision table describing the implemented features looks as follows, which I have put it on the right hand side. And here, if you see, we have got around eight test cases based on the three conditions. You know that is two raised to three, which is a basic rule of creating this truth table or condition action table. So two raised to three is equal to eight, and you have eight combinations here. But right there comes the main part of the question. The question says, based only on the features description, feature descriptions of the customer relationship management system, which of the below rules describes an impossible situation? Fantastic. Now, all we have to do is we have to find out out of this entire eight combinations of the different true and false, which one seems to be impractical or something which is impossible. There are two ways to solve this type of question. You can go ahead and start evaluating each of these uh, test cases, like all eight of them, and see what is looking a little hypothetical or something which is not realistic enough to work in the real time. Or you can be option driven as well. You can pick the options only which are given to you because of course one of them is the right answer. So you can pick the options and start putting in the table to see are they really making sense or not. So of course going one by one would make more sense, but I would do the second method because we know the logic. However, if required, you can always drop me a comment. We'll talk about it. Okay, so let's start with that. Um, of course, R4 makes it clear. Okay, because R4 has says, uh, says uh, being a member, that is true. That means you are a member. Miss deadline, that is false. That means you have never missed a deadline and you complete 15th rental? No. Okay, sorry, it's R4. So it's true. So you complete the 15th rental. So one way, you are a member and you have never missed a deadline and you have also completed the 15th rental. That means you are applicable for 20% discount. And at the same time, you are also going to get a t-shirt because you have fulfilled the 15th rental. So that seems to be very practical and talking about both the possible conditions fulfilled, sorry, both the actions fulfilled. If you see the next one, R2, R2 says uh, uh, you are a member, that is true. Miss deadline, false, no, never. And you have not completed 
the 15th rental yet that is false so not yet completed 15th rental so you would only get 20 percent discount that's very much practical that's possible go to r6 which is option c says that all three are false that means you are not a member never missed a deadline and not even completed 15th rental but that does not make a difference as an output for me because you're not a member so you'll not get 20 percent discount and anyways you have not completed 15th rental but don't forget the uh, t-shirt is a gift only for members okay not for the non-member so r6 will not have any actions to be performed and that's pretty much practical and if i look at the r8 which is the d says uh, being a member no okay you're not a member and did you miss deadlines yes that means completely contradicting with the scenario and have you completed the 15th rental yes so will you get a t-shirt no because if you look up and say what was the condition the conditions clearly says that after 15th rental members get a gift so if you are not a member because r8 says you are not a member that's false so how can you get a t-shirt so that looks a little impractical so that's what exactly we need to you know apply when it when you look at the table and try to conclude with a respective answer which would make more sense right and in that context put together the right answer here is d that is r8 is a combination of not a member missing deadlines and completing 15th rental should it get a t-shirt is impractical to be performed right so this is the way you should really have patience and attention to detail to solve these questions trust me if you don't have patience and attention to detail you may get confused with it and you would spend a more long time to solve the simple question so just do it one in one particular approach one step and that's it move to the next one right so similarly we are moving to the next one the next question we have is related to uh, state transition testing and the question number is 23 talks about you test a system whose life cycle is modeled by the state transition diagram now whatever the system is we don't care as shown below the system starts in the init state okay the init state is extremely on the left if you see on the picture uh, and ends its operation in the off state which is right top okay so the picture is very clear in it to debug mode then debug mode to off then in it to in operation then goes to on hold there's a loop there pause resume on hold and then goes to off again right so yep that pretty much it makes it clear makes us clearer that what the picture is all about then what is the minimum number of test cases again minimum number of test cases to achieve valid transition coverage now that's the most and most important thing that what is being asked to you we may have to stress a little bit on that minimum number of test case is the approach of all the techniques second important thing they're talking about valid transitions coverage that means we are only worried about valid at this point of time and second is the transitions alone they are not talking about you know the paths the one wise the two wise that is zero switch one switch etc so there is no loop and other things really required to be performed but the point is that in what minimum number of test cases you can cover every single transition so let's start doing that if you look at the picture once again the picture says that i can go from init that is test to debug mode from there i can go to done and then off so in simple word test done is one test which i can follow the second test is from init to in operation then from in operation to debug mode and then off so that means run error done is my second test which covers this side of all the transition now i'm left with pause and resume and then the done on the right hand side so in it in operation then i can go to on hold and i can also go to off but same time if i want i can just do a quick loop there to cover it with minimum test that is in it in operation on hold in operation on hold and off so in that case what happens is run uh, pause resume then coming back to on hold and then go to done so in that context uh, we can have it with just three test cases one from test to done then one is run error and then done and then completing that loop in one single test itself because we find we need to find out the minimum see however you can always tell me that these four are possible one i can go with pause and then done then i can do the loop and then done then i can even come back and say you know trying about possible combinations right 
So we need to pay attention to what is being asked to us. Is that like they're trying all possible ways the valid transition can be tested or they're trying to ask you the minimum number of test cases for all part, all transition coverage. So there's a difference between that. Okay, minimum coverage, maximum coverage. If you remember this from my tutorials, great. If not, do watch that once again. Okay, so here it was about minimum coverage and that can be done with just three test cases. Okay, so if in case you do not understand, just watch this tutorial once again, like rewind it, start again, and it would make sense, right? So that's all. Uh, okay, before that, of course, the right answer to this particular question is D, that is three test cases would be enough in terms of minimum test cases for 100% valid test transition coverage. So that's all from this particular tutorial team. Should you have anything else, feel free to comment below. I'm always there to address your queries and answer them well. Till then, keep learning, keep exploring, keep understanding the context. Thanks for watching the video team and happy learning.